Did you know that in 2021, VR games brought in over $2 billion in revenue? The VR opportunity is growing fast, but many of us are struggling to master the medium because what works on a flat screen doesn't always work when you're in an immersive environment. Welcome back. I'm Amy Jo Kim, founder of the Game Thinking Academy. Today, we're featuring five tips for designing great VR experiences, featuring legendary game designer and CMU professor, Jesse Shell. Along with his company, Shell Games, Jesse has built products on just about every platform, including his hit VR franchise, I Expect You to Die. Want to find out what a world-class experience designer knows about designing in VR? Listen in. First of all, it starts by talking about it, talking about just understanding that you're not making a game. No one cares about a game. A game is just a thing that sits there. The thing you care about is the experience of playing that game. That's what you care about. The game is an inert object and a game enables a certain experience because when someone engages with it, they have that certain experience. If I could just make the experience and give you that and not bother with the game, I would do it, but I can't. The game is like a necessary step in order to get you to have a certain experience. We start by acknowledging that experiences exist and that that is what we are creating. We are creating experiences and experiences are all we care about. We don't care about anything that's not the experience, right? We acknowledge that and we talk about that. And then you get into the question of like, if I'm designing an experience, what would I want this experience to be and why? And of course, some experiences are more important than others. And what is it about this experience that is different and special? And then we start breaking it down into what are the things that make an experience great? You know, we talk about interest curves. We talk about the importance of emotion and surprises. Usually that's my big shortcut. If people say, how do I make this better? I say, just add emotion and surprises. There's nothing wrong with starting mechanics first. The board game designer, Reiner Nizia, people always ask him, well, how do you start when you're making a board game? And he points out that if you always start in the same place, you're always going to finish in the same place. So you can start in lots of different places. You could start with mechanics. You could start with the art. You could start with an image. You can, you can start in many places, but ultimately, you, you know, what you're going to is that, that place of experience. Because you'll have people who hold these rigid views. They'll say things like, story is most important. Look at the people at Pixar. They always say story is the most important. Everything's about story. You got to start with the story. Don't let the technology define you. And I say, great, Pixar, you made a movie once called Toy Story. And did you choose that particular story because it was the best story that anyone could tell? A story about two toys? Or did you choose that story because you couldn't actually render people very well? And you recognized that when you rendered plastic toys, they looked really good, but your people looked really bad. So you said to yourself, okay, the technology determines we're good at making toys. Maybe we should make a story around that. So they really let the technology come first. And then they figured out what story could they make around it. I guess what I'm pointing out is they started with the technology, but they didn't stay there. Then they said, what experience could we make that would be the best experience you could make with this particular technology? Back around 2014, 2015, I was having trouble persuading people at my studio that VR was worth doing. I was very passionate about it and I felt there was a real path forward for it. But a lot of people, like they didn't quite see it. They didn't quite get it. And so what we were doing was we were looking at VR experiences that were good and I was getting people to start to build VR experiences. They were being a little puzzle solving experience. I warned them, I get it. You want to move from place to place. Make sure it's a teleport. Don't move us linearly through the space because that's going to cause motion sickness. So don't do that. Make sure that when you you click these things, you're going to teleport from space to space. And they ignored me and they created this kind of ease in out motion as you move through the space. And it was really nauseating. And I said, hey, why did you do this? And they just shook their head. They're like, this is why VR sucks because you can't move around. When you put on that headset, you want to feel like a superhero and instead you're tied to a chair. What kind of superhero gets tied to a chair?
And we all looked at each other and we're like, wow, superheroes get tied to the chair all the time. But nobody ever made a game about that. What if we made a game that was all about a superhero tied to a chair and how they have to kind of MacGyver their way out of it? What if that's the whole game? And then we started joking, you know, is that there's that moment in Goldfinger when James Bond is tied down and the laser's coming at him and he says, so do you expect me to talk? And Goldfinger says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die, right? And we just thought, could we make a whole game about that? Because we realized that would solve the problem of moving around in VR. And so we started experimenting with that. And we found that it was really fun. It really was exciting and fun because again, back to the essence of what does the technology afford? Normal video games are about running, 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 endlessly running. You're just going to never stop running. You're going to run everywhere all the time. VR doesn't want to be about running. The motion sickness is a problem, but what VR is really good at is manipulating things with your hands. Normal video games are terrible at manipulating things with their hands. It's awkward. You're just pushing a couple buttons. You're using your two thumbs to try and do everything with your hands. In VR, you actually reach out and pick up and manipulate things with all of the power that you know your hands actually have. So we realized that, okay, let's make a game that focuses on hands and manipulation as opposed to kind of moving all over the place. In terms of emotion and surprises, dying is, of course, naturally an emotional thing. Part of the fun of the game is you're trying to solve these puzzles and problems and everything goes wrong. There are surprises in that there are many unexpected ways, like things you wouldn't think would be dangerous end up being quite dangerous. And the ways that you can kind of stop them from being dangerous ends up being really fun and surprising. A really funny key that we found to this was we realized how important it was to make it a comedy game because they think about comedy as so things are funny because people like to laugh and that's the purpose of comedy but comedy has surprising other purposes if i make a world that's very serious and then something goes wrong or is silly the world is broken now right because this was super serious world and then something silly happened like an object went through another object or somebody got something stuck on their face. And that's funny because when something silly happens to somebody serious, that's really funny, but it breaks the serious thing. The serious thing has now been taken down a peg. But if you start with a world that's already funny and then something goes a little bit wrong, it actually fits the world. Like, oh, this is already a funny world. Oh, this weird thing happened. The world just got stronger. So we realized that in a game where people are going to experiment and try a lot of crazy things they're going to try silly things if we make it a slightly silly world it now just ends up getting stronger and being more solid and then further we know if we're going to make a game about you being a secret agent guess what you're not a secret agent you're going into this thing and you don't know a damn thing about what you're doing right we could pretend that you're james bond and we can pretend that you know everything about what you're doing but you don't that's funny the idea of an incompetent secret agent is just a naturally funny idea and so all of those things kind of fit together really well and so we just started kind of building out games that were around that. And then one of the things that's really nice about that, again, it's one of the powers of comedy is when you have a thing that's got a comic base, when something serious happens, it actually stands out and it's really meaningful because you think, oh, we're all joking, joking, joking. But now, oh my God, you just saved somebody's life and they're really thankful and sincere. It really stands out as a moment. And so you have these opportunities to create these emotional moments that nobody expects because they think we're just kind of fooling around in this silly world where everything explodes. Anyway, I could talk about I Expect You to Die all day, but it's been a tremendously fun property that we've been really glad to be able to work on. Wasn't that great? One of my biggest takeaways is Jesse's approach to finding that sweet spot between your game and the technology to create a great experience rather than just blindly copying something from one medium to another. If you want to dig deeper into Jesse's brilliance and get hot tips for game design, check out his classic book, The Art of Game Design. The link is in the description. We'll be publishing more design tips from Jesse in the coming weeks, so make sure you subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss a thing. See you next week.